And then of course, when we think of the, the Samsung debacle, like uh, folks in leadership are obviously deeply concerned about having their source code uh, go out to these servers <laughs> right. where you know ChatGPT and things are, are, are ru actually running. Uh, and then it's just out in the ether and, and they're trained on it, right? And it's just gone, you know? So, well, it's not gone at all, actually. <laughs> it can now be retrieved. Um, so I think that folks uh, in the, the C-suite are, are extremely concerned about it in that way. But at the same time, of course, um, there's a lot of productivity gains that can be had. And so, uh, you know, a number of developers are, are just, you know, rapturous about not having to write unit tests. I, I've heard one of the, the most popular use cases tends to be uh, for migration, right? And so again, I follow the JavaScript ecosystem. When frameworks change, mm -hmm. uh, it can be extremely tedious to have to update all of these different dependencies and, you know, some of the, the different class names and things, you know, they no longer have to do that. Welcome to Software Snack Bites. I'm your host, Shomit Ghosh of Bold Start Ventures. And today we're excited to have James Governor and Kate Holterhoff on the show. James and Kate are analysts at Redbunk, the developer-focused analyst firm. And in this episode, we're going to cover evolving trends in developer tooling and the landscape today. So I think first to start things off, uh, you know, James, I, I want you to give some context behind starting Redbunk, because I think it was uh, 2002. Oh, where uh, the oh, the, uh, the firm was <laughs> right in with the the the, the low blow. <laughs> yeah, uh, we've been doing this for a while. We've been doing this for a while, and you know, I think as much as anything else, we tracked uh, as a company some of the fundamental shifts in in how the industry has been constituted. So, I think um, you know when we uh, launched the firm, uh, we we're really one of the few, um, certainly advisory research firms that in our kind of space. It was just so clear that open source was going to be absolutely fundamental to how software was built. Um, the idea that, that you know, um, enterprises would not adopt that or that it wouldn't be a significant part of the landscape, that was still happening. There were still people go, oh, no, you know, it, this is not going to be an enterprise phenomenon. And it was just really obvious to us right then uh, that it was. Uh, you know, other sort of mega trends. If we think about social, we jumped onto that really early. So you know, uh, blogging was something that that, that was just very obviously um, a, a good conversational model for doing research, a great way of building community, punching above your weight. And obviously, then the cloud comes in. Cloud again, you've got this sort of skepticism. Oh, you know. Um, are, are, what kind of adoption is this going to be? Is this just startups? You know, very clear to us that it was going to become part of the industry landscape. And I think if we tie all of that together, whilst we began the firm thinking, look, we need a company that is going to help people to understand the impacts of open source. As time went on, it really became clear to us that the phenomenon was really developer-driven tech adoption, hmm. that open source was sort of an underpinning for that, but open source was not the thing. It was just part of the phenomenon. So one of the reasons that, that open source became so you know, widely adopted was because developers found it so easy to get the bits. And if you make things easy for developers, you're going to get better results. So I think the, the industry has kind of moved that way. And, and yeah, I mean, we we just felt that um, uh, you know, further this open source thing, if you are trying to understand technology adoption purely through the lens of the purchaser, then you don't know what's going on. Like, yeah, fine, that was okay back in the olden days when we launched the firm. You know, you'd have 18 months dog and pony show, you know, deals on golf courses. You know, it was all about the salesperson in the room. That is just not how software is adopted today. Like, if you can't get the bits... In, in people's hands, you're going to struggle. Well, so, so Kate, what does analysis in this developer ecosystem look like? I mean, you could talk about developer experience, you could talk about integrations, you could talk about, uh, there's just so many different things. So when you're analyzing a product or a group of products, like how are you actually going about doing that in the developer ecosystem? 
Yeah, well, you know, I, obviously the the answer every analyst is going to get a view is that it depends. But I think there's a few things that we look at, right? Um, so, you know, what we tend to do is we frequent developer watering holes, right? So we spend a lot of time on Hacker News. We go to a lot of conferences and talk to developers, um, you know, in their happy place, right? Uh, giving presentations about things that they're excited about, um, doing the hallway track, right? Uh, and then, of course, you know, we're spending time on Twitter and Reddit and, and focusing on these forums, you know, increasingly Discord in order to see what they are actually excited about. So when we're thinking about developer experience, I think uh, for us, it's really about trying to get an authentic sense of what developers actually are thinking. And, you know, lately I've been thinking a lot about the, the fact that developers are not a monolith. Right. Um, I talk a lot about upskilling. Uh, certifications, how, you know, folks are entering the space, the big reskilling move, right? Um, if we think about the pandemic and all the folks who, um, you know, there was a great uh, reshuffle in terms of where folks mm -hmm. were working. Um, you know, all of that kind of uh, plays into the fact that there's a lot of folks who are, are joining the field uh, and are, you know, having very different experiences from the sort of stereotypical grumpy sysadmin that uh, tends to be particularly loud on, on uh, places like Hacker News. And so, you know, when we think about what it what it means to actually uh, reach developers, I think there's a lot of nuance there. And so the fact that we are just completely honed into what it is that developers are thinking. And uh, when we are briefed by vendors, they're bringing us uh, the developer's experience. You know, we always ask, how is it that developers actually like using your product? You know, give us a demo. <laughs> what is the interface like? How does it, uh, you know, integrate with their existing stack? Right. How interoperable is it? And so, you know, we, we really are able to bring this perspective um, that I think is, you know, certainly unique to, to Redmonk, but also um, it really colors the way that we are thinking about developer experience as a, as a firm, uh, because it certainly is evolving, right? I mean, if, you know, we think back, uh, Apple had a, a sort of DevX program in the 80s, right? So it's, it's a longstanding you know, way of thinking through, uh, you know, how developers are going to interact with your, uh, your products. Um, but, you know, it wasn't until like 2013 that we started seeing this sort of like API driven economy and, you know, developer first um, mindset that that now has really uh, taken over and made the developer tooling industry so lucrative and exciting um, and made developer experience just like absolutely essential to anyone who wants to uh, succeed in this space. Kate, I, I want to start with you on this, and then James, I want to hear your thoughts. Is um, I'll invoke uh, another research fund in the space, uh, Gartner. Right, you have the Gartner hype cycle, and uh, and I think in in developer tooling, right, we have these hype cycles. It was like container orchestration wars uh, that was going on. I remember service meshes were like the biggest deal for for a long time, right? Jamstack, uh, which ironically now may actually be having uh, its its moment again, but um, but like. When you're in those moments, what's the like? Because there's so much promise that that's why that there those hype cycles are happening. But at the same time, there's there's all these like still challenges in adoption and who's using it and stuff like that. So, how do you kind of diagnose what's going on in that moment? Yeah, I mean that's something that I, I think um, when James mentioned the credibility thing, it's something that's certainly top of mind for us. Like we don't want to just you know, overemphasize the importance of something that is brand new, but at the same time we want to follow it. And you know, we're Tech folks ourselves, we're geeks. We really get excited when when new things are coming out, and so we follow them and share posts and and you know read all the blogs that are that are really following it. And so you know, so that's something that we we endeavor to be measured and level headed. But you know, to to survive as an analyst, I think it's essential to keep you know abreast of the waves, still keeping the sort of nuanced glasses on. Um, so, I, but I, I think uh, maybe it's it's useful to kind of dig into one of those examples that you had. So you know, I, I was a front end engineer, so Jamstack to me has been the one that I follow the most. And frankly, you know, I have been um, uh, at Redmond for two years. So for me, the, the hype cycle is a, is a little uh, less than, than James's, you'll forgive me. Uh, but, uh, you know, so Jamstack is something that I have seen, even in my time there, really uh, lose a lot of speed. And I think what's, what's interesting about the Jamstack situation is that there, uh, you know, as you noted, um, you know, there's there's already been a lot of movement in terms of like the excitement. So, uh, and it really, I, I think, comes down to community in that particular case. So, you know, so Jamstack really, you know, it was coined in 2016 by Matt Billman. So he, you know, and it's this sort of architectural approach to to sort of lay out what what we're talking about with Jamstack. It's sort of, uh, you know, it, it sounds punchy, but but actually is an, an acronym for um, JavaScript APIs and Markdown. Um, and so, you know, uh, it, and it was really uh, held up by by Netlify. So it was it was one of those keywords that was 
uh, made a thing uh, by a particular vendor. And of course, there's a lot of problems associated with that. And then just recently, they decided, Netlify decided that they are actually going to uh, jettison uh, the Jamstack uh, for various reasons. I think most of it having to do with it just being overly complicated for um, most front end developers. And they're now talking about the composable web. So fine, they sort of discontinued the Discord server. They got rid of the conference. You know, they they sort of powered down. But then there's been folks um, who, like uh, Zach Leatherman, who have said, actually, we like Jamstack. It was doing a lot of good work here. We're going to uh, try to revive this term and uh, take it away. You know, take it out of the context of of Netlify and their their sort of uh, ecosystem and and make it its own thing um, because it had you know a great following. Um, I virtually attended the Jamstack conference. I mean the the number of sort of lights in the front end space that attended um, was, you know, remarkable. I mean, and and it's interesting because it's positioned uh, outside of, you know, Vercel. And of course, Vercel is taking up a lot of oxygen in the in the room in terms of front end. I'm sure we'll talk about them again later. But, um, but you know, Jamstack was doing a lot of really important work. And so there's been this, this new movement to, to sort of reframe what Jamstack can do. And I think it's a really great sort of uh, way of thinking through the, the nuance there instead of just saying like, Jamstack's over, Jamstack's dead, which actually is, is you know, I, I've seen that, that that uh, kind of thrown around. If you actually listen to the developers and what they think, uh, they're 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 saying, well, it's not dead, and the reason is that the community is so um, sort of forceful and vibrant that we're actually going to refocus the definition, and we're going to try to strengthen the community around these sort of new values that are are no longer connected to just a single vendor. Like we're going to try to make it a more robust. Uh, space by bringing in more people. That makes sense. Yeah. James, one question I have for you in this area is, you know, uh, the container orchestration era, right? Like we had these robust communities in like Mesos, Docker Swarm, uh, you know, of course, then Kubernetes came in. I'm forgetting some of the others. There was, there was, you know, even, you know, the chef's puppets of the world, like all these folks that were sort of in this space, they had vibrant uh, communities. They had real use cases, like, how do you go through the analysis of something like that when Kubernetes comes out or something like, is it, what, what are you looking for? What factors are you like looking for that? Hey, this might be the, the thing that people start to adopt or whatever. This is a great question. I mean, look, we, um, we're doing this for a while. And I mean, some of it is, you know, what are, what are the maxims? I mean, it's like the future's already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Right. So William Gibson, I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not so hard to see the future. And again, much though I talked about the global, um, implications of what is going on. I mean, you know, if you watch tools that people are getting super excited about south of market, chances are high that those sorts of approaches and tools are likely to find their way into um, the wider market. And then you start correlating that with just, as, as Kate mentioned, you know, there are platforms that we can get some some data from. So, you know, when we do our programming language rankings, um, we use data uh, from uh, GitHub and Stack Overflow, do a scatter plot and try and understand, um, you know, what will be happening in, time, in terms of future um, usage through a snapshot, really, of, of the conversations and developer behaviors um, around particular programming languages or frameworks. You know, it was just so clear that Docker was just one of the most explosively growing technologies that we'd ever seen. It was it was obvious that containers was going to be a thing, right? So you know we'd seen sort of the open stacks and and so on and and yeah, great, okay, it you know had some telcos adopt it. Um, we had the sort of the cloud foundry. I've um, got some pretty good enterprise adoption. Um, Pivotal did a pretty good job of basically training training enterprises to do modern software development and then you know use cloud foundry. But Docker was just like right from the word go. It was cool. You know GitHub itself. Actually, like Git had been around for a while. People were kind of casting around being like, um, I think we need a new way to do version control because this centralized thing sucks. And Git was there and it was like, okay, but GitHub, when that came out, it was just very, very clear. If you spent time with developers and, you know, developers that do interesting work, that that was just going to be a game changer. And, and Docker was a bit like that. And I think, you know, some of what we do is we're like cool hunters. We're like, we're like the people that hang out in Shibuya and they're looking at what the kids are wearing and, and you know, being like, OK, in, you know, like 18 months, that is what they're going to be wearing in New York. There is an aspect of 
you know, pattern matching. That's something that 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 all VCs do. Um, but yeah, you you look at the behaviors of, of people in the communities um, that you you're interested in. Um, you begin to trust some people that you that I mean, people with great radar. I mean, Jesus, it's just like what a gift. So you know, if you want to understand what's going to happen with LLMs, you spend time paying attention to what Simon Willison is saying mm-hmm. because he's doing the work and he is educating. And and you know, the great thing for us as a company is we've never felt the need like we package up things in a way that people can understand. But we've never felt the need to be like, oh, it's all us. Mm. It's hermetically sealed. You know, some other analyst companies would want to be like, this is our view. And the world must fit into our view. We're much more interested in meeting people where they are and understanding their view, understanding their language, Jamstack or or whatever it is. Um, Yeah, sometimes Gartner defines the terminology. We end up talking about IDPs, internal developer platforms. And you're like, is that the best term? I don't know. But uh, very often it's it's the market that decides. It's the, it's the developer conversation that tends to be more fun. And yeah, we are in those developer conversations. I think we try and spot what's going to happen, um, continue those conversations, start to look for adoption, find what qualitative um, evidence that we can, and then and then you know make those like those decisions. Yeah, make those judgments, and yeah. that's I think what what we've got a good track record on, and people trust us with. So I, I want to move into the uh, the impact that AI is having on developers, and you know you mentioned the, the the language rankings, and one of the most interesting things from that post, which I read, the I think it was actually called we'll, we'll link to it in the show notes. What's called what's going on with language rankings? Mm-hmm. And one of the most interesting things from reading that was basically there there seemed to be a clear impact of Copilot not only on Stack Overflow but also on on GitHub itself and the data there. And so I guess where I want to start is sort of, I mean, what, what is going on with Copilot? Like, have we reached the promised land and, you know, all developers are going to be super productive and everything's going to be great. Like what, you know, how, how do you explain this to folks uh, who are thinking about, you know, is it a junior developer, is it a senior developer, is it the best thing since sliced bread? Like what, what's going on? A couple of things, but but I but Kate is going to say something. But we need to be a little bit cautious about saying, well, the you know that the phenomena are driven by Copilot. Like when you see things like that, you need to be causation and co- correlation. You need to be a little bit careful. There there are some weird and interesting things. For me, the thing I was most weirded out by was the fact that like pull requests on projects are falling. Yes. That to me was like the okay that we need to drill into, and so we've got some things that you'll hear about. But I'm really, I'm a bit cautious of saying, oh, everybody's using Copilot, so nobody's going to use Stack Overflow again. There are all sorts of things in Stack Overflows, business model in in you know, th- there are all sorts of things that that we need to be a bit cautious about saying, oh, now we've moved over into the Nirvana and it's all done for those platforms. Very, I'm very cautious of that. Yeah. But I think that Kate has uh, a, an interesting take. Well, I think we could just do like some level setting. So actually, James, I didn't look this up. How long have has Redmond been doing language rankings at this point? Uh, I, 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 off the top of my head, I can't remember, but it's been a while. It's been a while. Okay. Okay. Well, so, you know, I, I guess just to like, for, for folks who, who are going to read the article, you know, it's just worth noting that. So our, our colleague, Rachel Stevens published this post and, you know, she is, you know, spearheads a lot of our language rankings, which come out biannually and track uh, using Stack Overflow and GitHub, what sort of languages are the most popular. And it ends up being a really uh, sort of important, what? Um, what? Artifacts for everybody. Yeah, artifact. I like that. Um, I was thinking deliverable and I was like, who are we delivering it to? Um, but yes, the, so it, you know, it gets a lot of traction on some of these dev watering holes I mentioned. So it's always, there's always that sort of uh, hacker news post uh, associated with it. And usually Steve O'Grady, the other co-founder of Red Monk hops on there to, to chat. So it, it ends up, uh, you know, drawing a lot of eyes to what we're doing at Red Monk. So yes, when Rachel published this post just recently saying, Hey, we're getting ready to come out with our, our, our newest set of rankings and the data is really weird right now and we are not sure what's going on. And so she has just started uh, thinking through what could be causing this. And it seems like AI and some of these co-pilots is 
may be related to this, but it doesn't explain everything as James, mm. you know, is mentioning here that we're trying to uh, be very cautious about trying to figure out what's going on here. And of course, it's always challenging with platforms, right? Because they give you a sort of glimpse into some of the data, but they don't always tell you everything, right? So uh, I think we're, we're, we're trying to figure out whether or not um, continuing the language rankings and the way that we've been doing it for years is going to be feasible. And so that's the challenge because the way that developers work right now because of AI, because of uh, AI code assistance, all of this is really uh, upending a lot of things that we took for granted. Um, but what we do know is that, yeah, the stack overflow has become less valuable to developers. It used to be the gold standard, right? This is where developers would go to do code snippets and to to argue about the best way to to accomplish something and, you know, looking for terminology. I mean, I think uh, everyone who has uh, learned to code has, has spent a lot of time there, especially junior developers. And so it's, it's a really important resource. But, you know, the question is, is it going to continue to be mm -hmm. uh, valuable as folks are, are more inclined to go into chat GPT and say, you know, ask their questions there? Um, you know, there's a lot of value to having a sort of non-judgmental uh, AI chatbot tell you uh, the answer rather than going on Stack Overflow, which is sort of famously uh, critical, especially of, of, of junior developers whose questions might not be um you know, the most sophisticated, right? So, um, so you know, and a lot of that's kind of based on stereotypes of the space. And so I certainly don't want to necessarily perpetuate those, but I think that the idea of uh, developers wanting a safe tool where they feel like they can learn in a, a non-judgmental way and in a, in a, at their own pace is is invaluable. And so I think that's, you know, that nobody can argue with that, that ChatGPT provides that in in ways that, that junior developers are finding uh, particularly useful. Um, and so, you know, how, how is that going to affect our language rankings? We're still working, working on figuring that out. That pull request reduction is pretty interesting because yeah. uh, like even if let's just say that my hypothesis, I'm not saying your guys hypothesis, my hypothesis is that, you know, co-pilots may have affected that. What I still don't understand is why would co-pilot or, or, or anything, frankly, like you're still going to have to merge and and you're still going to have to like do code reviews and stuff like so why would it go down so there are some interesting things i mean one i mean it's weird that lockdown correlated with irrational exuberance that from from cloud companies right so on the one hand you know we're all living this well actually i i didn't have a bad time i mean i got long covid and that was bad yeah that wasn't fun but spending so much time with my family epic like being able to like never have to travel and like just be home with my kids all the time was amazing. So that was that was that, that was great. But you remember the lives we were living? Any cloud service, whether I mean Netflix or whatever, was going to be getting an awful lot of use and adoption. Mm -hmm. And so GitHub was doing events where they were like talking about, oh look, you know, people are doing. You know, and, and we've gone from the awful thing of like, you know, well, I think it's awful, but like, oh, it's my streak and I'm going to, I've developed every day for like the past eight years and I'm going to keep on. I mean, it's like, you know, people sharing their tiles and stuff. Yeah. Okay. But oh my goodness. But yeah, GitHub was finding that people would do it were like, they were writing code much later in the day. And, you know, I'd be like, and I guess that's partly, oh, I've spent a lot of my time looking after my family or doing some of my other activities. And so, you know, now I'm doing those, you know, or weekend activities, like what are you, we couldn't go out. So what are you going to do? You're going to be like a Finnish software developer. You know, you're going to invent, <laughs> you're going to invent Linux or invent MySQL or invent Varnish Cache or invent any of the other, you know, Nordic technologies that get invented when you're stuck in the ice, in the dark <laughs> for months on end you're more likely to just spend your time, if you're a developer, what are you gonna do? Right, you ship code. So then that makes sense. So you're saying it, it might actually be explained by, in fact, just literally you're lapping COVID still. Yeah, okay. Give people their lives back. And you know, funnily enough, they'll be like, oh, wait, there's other stuff I can do other than spending my time, as you say, slinging code. So, you know, I think some of it may be a return to normality. Then there was zero, zero interest rate phenomenon. Yep. I mean, how many developers have been laid off? How many developers have been laid off in the past 18 months? Right. And if they were, if they, you know, if they were being paid in and around their, 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 the job of writing software, you know, maybe they're working on their own projects. But in terms of, 
um, development at scale, the kinds of thing that's going to make a meaningful impact on like pull requests on projects, it's possible, you know, fewer people with jobs writing software might just have an implication for activity on GitHub. So I, I, there's all sorts of weird possibilities, I think. That's interesting because you're basically explaining, I think, un, 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 not unfortunately, like a bit of a Twitter filter bubble that at least I saw, which was everyone was retweeting it and being like, oh, my God, it's the coming of AI. This is this is disrupting business models and everything. And you're like, wait a second. No, actually, you know, there's a lot of other factors that could impact this. We're a bit cautious because honestly, even though and, you know, I talk about like, you know, Shibuya. I mean, for all the fact that that chat GPT immediately became, you know, like a hugely fast growing like consumer product. And, you know, that we have great stories. Uh, you know, my colleague Rachel, her mother had been looking for a, a new a, a microwave that would fit a specific thing in, 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 a, in a cabinet they had. And she wasn't going to pay the ridiculous thousand or the, if that is like two thousand dollar one, she could. And she tried Google a bunch of kept trying and trying. What you heard about chat GPT, she's like, here's a new search engine. Maybe I can find my microwave. So she found a microwave that could fit the thing. This is a consumer product, right? This is a, a product that anyone can use, but it is not today a tool that all developers have suddenly been like, I'm working in a hundred percent different way. That is not, that's filter bubble. It is definitely filter bubble to assume that like everyone is out there every day using, you know, like, tools like code copilot and chat gpt to to write all their code because that's just not or to get or to do the conversation that that kate is talking about that is still it is still early days for that so yeah will it happen 100 percent. but you know has it happened mm, i i think it's way too early to be like oh the future just happened and everything is done and yeah we should we should check our biases at the door and i think that's a good even me asking that question right i was i was uh, now i'm like okay that's interesting i should be thinking about it a little bit more but you know uh kate i want to ask you a question because i think you've, you've thought in, uh, about this uh, a, a decent amount but what's sort of the downstream impact of in, in potentially the near-term future, having a majority of our code being AI-generated? Yeah, well, it's something that uh, I know <laughs> a number of folks of leadership are worried about. But I mean, I think immediately it's going to be the amount of code that we produce and, you know, possibly low-quality code. I mean, I think what's interesting about uh, the, you know, studying the code, uh, AI code generation uh, space is that you see um, a lot of developers complaining about the bugginess of this code, right? That um, you want to treat these um, code assistants as like savvy interns uh, or, you know, even folks in the junior developer role, which is a, a sort of um, a problematic way of framing it. But, uh, but you know, that it's, it's something that needs to be reviewed. So the amount of uh, code that is low quality that's coming out is, is something that I think a lot of folks are uh, concerned about. And so what that, when I say low quality, I mean that, you know, there's security risks, mm -hmm. that it is, you know, calling APIs that don't exist, that it is, um, you know, maybe bringing in some insecure um, elements, right? So uh, security is a big part of it. And then, of course, when we think of the the Samsung debacle, like uh, folks in leadership are obviously deeply concerned about having their source code uh, go out to these servers <laughs> right. where, yes, where these, uh, um, uh, you know, chat GPT and things are, are, are actually running. Uh, and then it's just out in the ether and, and they're trained on it, right? And it's just gone, you know? So, well, it's not gone at all, actually. <laughs> it can now be retrieved. Um, so I think that folks uh, in the, the C-suite are, are extremely concerned about it in that way. But at the same time, of course, um, there's a lot of productivity gains that can be had. And so, uh, you know, a number of developers are, are just, you know, rapturous about not having to write unit tests. I, I've heard one of the, the most popular use cases tends to be uh, for migration, right? And so, again, I follow the JavaScript ecosystem. When frameworks change, mm -hmm. uh, it can be extremely tedious to have to update all of these different dependencies and, you know, some of the, the different class names and things, you know, they no longer have to do that, right? Um, even just, you know, changing the templating language, right? You know, all of these things can be now automated. And I think that that's, you know, kind of contributes to a larger narrative of, you know, automation, right? And you can, we could even bring in the, the um, you know, I talk about buggy code um, or, or even like black box solutions, right? That, that you 
can't see the code that you're you're bringing in. Um, we we have um, low code and no code as as you know part of this conversation, right? And this has been going on uh, for for a while now. So AI is just sort of the, the newest way of of giving folks that are in charge of these code bases anxiety because it's like now what are we dragging into this tenuous uh, ball of wax that I'm I'm trying to to keep together, right? Um, you know, so how 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 are uh, you know we going to to manage this this new challenge is is absolutely top of mind. But you know developers are tinkerers, right? They're excited to use it, and and I think there's we're not going to say no to them, right? You know that that's uh, I think a fool's errand. The the um, these new tools are here to stay, and they're doing great work, and they're going to improve. Um, but it's you know something to, that everyone should be keeping their eye on, a, a very wary eye, right? Um, the, the Air Canada uh, issue with their chatbot, yeah. uh, you know. Uh, that one just cracked me up because I, I love that the consumer uh, got their money back at the end of the day, right? But, you know, chatbots are going to be promising things to customers that don't exist, right? Or that, you know, uh, that now need to be honored, um, you know, based on based on this ruling. And so, you know, there's I, we're that's only just, you know, two sort of recent news reports about this. There are doubtless going to be, uh, you know, hundreds uh, in the future. Yeah, I think that that makes a ton of sense. And, and James, I, w- I want to ask you, uh, Another aspect of that is is potentially we could have agents running around and uh, you know running our infrastructure or, or when I say running I mean more like maintaining uptime or or doing some of the debugging or stuff like that. I mean, how should we prepare for that world? Is that something we should be scared of? Like, is it going to happen anyway? Like, w- w- what are your thoughts there? You know, I mean, I, I think like anything, there are two sides to it, and. So Kate has talked about the amount of software that will be created that will all need to be uh, maintained. I think one of the questions is when do we throw it away because software becomes more situational. Um, if I'm able to sort of scratch more itches, then there's going to be a lot more software. I mean, you know, to you as a, a VC, you've, you're like, you know, for some of the people that you're talking to that are investable, instead of them having like the one thing they built, they might be like, well, I built these five things. Oh God. <laughs> and, you know, like, and I, they're all going to be pretty cool. And, and it, back to Simon Willison, he says that it used to be that he it, one of his 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 questions would be, hang on a minute, um, how long is it going to take me to learn that new thing, that library or that front end? You know, he's not a front end developer, so like to learn that front end thing. If I wanted to build something for my platform data set, like what would I what would I need to learn to do it? Oh, you know what? I need to learn a lot, so I'm just going to keep on building core functionality. Now he'll go, he'll play with something. He will use Chat GPT. He'll build something that's roughly functional. He'll be like, oh, I can kind of see how that works and he'll improve it. And then, so now he says the, the longest thing he has is writing the blog posts about, you know, trying the new idea. Now I'm partly like, Simon, why don't you get the AI to write the blog post too? But, <laughs> but, but so there's going to be a lot more software that, and as Kate says, that creates all sorts of challenges. The question about decision-making um, is super interesting. You know, um, like, uh, we rely as a society on um, on agents already, or algorithms. I mean, algorithms. You know, we live in a, in a in a somewhat algorithmic world. It's becoming more algorithmic, and sometimes it's funny. Um, you know, uh, trying to get Gemini to, you know, come up with a a, a white person. It's like, <laughs> you know, you know, when has it ever been a thing that white people were underrepresented? Like. And it's sort of funny, but it's also interesting. And you can be like, oh, hi, look, uh, Google's so dumb. They over-rotated on wokeness. Uh." It's like, well, okay. Um, But on the other hand, think about the experiences, the other experiences. And again, um, Rachel wrote a great piece. She wanted to use one of these uh, headshot generators. And it's like a woman trying to generate a headshot, which doesn't show cleavage, is quite difficult. Mm. That's not cool. Wow. And so we we are living in a world where there, there's going to be more of this. Um, a lot of this stuff needs to be worked out because, I mean, we have to establish trust with the algorithms. Um, as you say, in terms of developing, I mean, distributed software uh, is, is non-deterministic. And distributed software with AI components is even more non-deterministic. And so that's going to create all sorts of challenges. Do you know what the good news is? We all got pay, get paid to solve challenges. We will have jobs. Like, we're not done yet. There are a bunch of things that need fixing, and there are going to be so many interesting things that need fixing. So, 
Look, I'm I'm half British and half American, so I'm like some of the time I'm just a cynical asshole. That's the Brit. <laughs> Other times I'm an optimistic asshole. That's the American. And so I'm like, uh, you know, some of the time I'm like, oh no, that'll never work. This is so terrible. Why are we doing this? And the other time I'm like, this is amazing. This is super exciting. This is like, so the truth is somewhere in between. And I think as long as there's work to be done, we'll be okay. Well, we will certainly have lots to deal with. But uh, one of the areas, uh, and Kate, you recently had a post that you wrote. Uh, we'll link to it in the uh, in the show notes. But um, it was on this front end workflow. We talked. We touched upon it briefly there. But it does seem like we're we're seeing, you know, at least uh, it. I know it's not called uh, Jamstack anymore. It's it's now component defined infrastructure, or whatever framework defined infrastructure, or something like that. But like it does seem we went from this wave. We we hit the trough, and now it seems to be like boom, back back skyrocketing up again. What's driving that? What are you seeing in the, on the front end side? Yeah, uh, so the front end uh, space, I think, is is deeply interesting. Uh, and so what I you know, I, I was always defending it from my soul. I was like, well, full stack is fine, I guess. But, you know, let's let's own the the, the front end. Right. In 2019, uh, Chris Coyer wrote a post called The Great Divide that really, I think, was this first movement of like, hey, we're front enders. It's OK. Like we're important, too. Right. And uh, and just, uh, you know, in the past couple of years, I think we're seeing a lot of vendors uh, actually uh, addressing uh, front end buyers in this way that they hadn't in the past. And so I uh, riffed on on uh, Stephen O'Grady's uh, The New Kingmakers by by writing a post about uh, front enders being the new kingmakers for that reason, because they are driving a lot of buying decisions. And so, you know, I, I was the first post in a three part series. I will be talking a little bit about, you know, what the, the full, uh, the full stack pendulum and what that means and a little bit about the history, um, of, of, you know, the front end and what all that means. But the, you know, the basic thesis is that we're seeing companies like Vercel talking about a front end cloud. Well, that's interesting, right? So we're not hiding behind full stack anymore. We're saying, yeah, no, we're here for the front end, right? We are going to support this particular group of developers. And again, I, I'm, I'm a, a big advocate of just not saying, hey, all developers are developers and they think the same way. It's like, let's think about different types of developers and different groups and communities within that within this uh, profession. OK, um, but then we also saw uh, see back end as a service uh, provider. So um, Supabase, they are catering to the Jamstack specifically. Um, so Paul Copplestone, he uh, was on the Changelog podcast uh, and, and spoke just very clearly. It didn't miss a beat, said, yeah, I am. I'm targeting the Jamstack. And so to me, that is just fascinating because we have products like Firebase um, and Supabase and all these sort of um, backend as a service uh, providers, uh, you know, and, and a lot of times it's it's the database and all the services that surround the database. And, you know, front end engineers don't necessarily want to fiddle with this. They mm -hmm. want to focus on things that excite them, which is the UI. Right. And so now there's all these companies that are, are will you know, recognizing this as like a, a huge demographic. And we can talk about why that would be. A lot of it has to do with, you know, new developers uh, are front end engineers first, and then they kind of migrate to the back end, or they're just excited by the space, right? Um, I became a front end developer because I have a background in design. So for me, it was it was a no brainer. I was like, obviously, I'm going to be a front end engineer because I want to be able to control the user's experience. That that's what excites me. Um, and so, uh, you know, so we're seeing uh, it not just be like this, you know ashamed group of folks trying to center the div, like that's the, you know, folks hiding behind full stack so that they could get paid a living wage instead of being like, oh, anyone could could write CSS. You know, people don't want to write CSS. You talk to back end uh, en uh, engineers about CSS and they all go, oh God, I don't want to touch it, no, right? They don't want to write it either, yeah. You know, so this is a very important skill set, and it's no easier than, uh, you know, working in the back end. And uh, frankly, there's a lot of money to be made there, right? Because if you are packaging services that that are, you know a managed service experience that does everything that the back end would do, uh, you know, package it for front end uh, consumers, you know that that is a great market to be in. And so we're seeing a lot of uh, vendors kind of recognize this and say, you know, the front end is is kind of a cool place to be. And you know, so in the post, I actually talk a little bit about like. Uh, the the identity associated with front end, you know, they tend to be more designers, so they tend to be to dress well. They carry themselves differently, and uh, and uh, you know, to to pick on Vercel a little bit, they they always wear the black t shirts, right? And they're very cool. Uh, so there's there's just like a whole look around uh, the front end that I think is is worth you know being proud of, right? Like 
the front end is not just like sad developers who aren't good enough to, to work in the back end. No, no, <laughs> they're they're important to listen to for a number of reasons, and they've got their own uh, identity, their own their own culture, right? They they're doing cool things, and we should pay attention to what they're doing. And frankly, it's where a lot of the innovation is happening, right? Like this is uh, extremely important to the story around cloud. So. You know, I get excited about this, uh, but yeah, I would say, you know, since 2019, the front end has been on the the uh, ascent and uh, we need, you know, folks who are just um, shrugging off front end is like, oh, you know, this is this is not an important part of the, uh, the stack. You know, the top of the stack is is not important. Uh, you know, our language rankings show that JavaScript is the absolutely mm -hmm. most popular language. It's extremely important, has been, you know, and, and, and front end is, is uh, you know, a, a testament to that. Right. And we need to be paying attention to that. And, and I certainly uh, wanted to step up and say, hey, you know, I'm here for the front end. Let's pay attention to them. They're the new kingmakers. I'm, I'm waiting uh, for I, I love that, that uh, we're, we're bringing power to the front end. Absolutely. Meanwhile, in my little community where I spend time in, like we're, we're talking about Zig and stuff like that. So it's very interesting to have this dichotomy between, you know, what's exciting people on the back end and then what's exciting folks on the front end, which certainly is all this AI stuff that's coming out is is really exciting. A lot of folks uh, on the front end side. So it's it's a fascinating uh, sort of place. But um you know, I, I want to move into uh, one more topic, which uh, I'd like to get uh, your guys' viewpoint on is um, open source licensing, right? We have all this sort of craziness that's happening. And, uh, and you know, HashiCorp just made this. Well, thanks. Thanks for this question. <laughs> this is just exactly. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Like how, how you need to get Stephen O'Grady on. You need to get <laughs> Stephen on. Stephen's the licensing guy. Just very quickly in terms of how you think about the, your viewpoint here, right? Like HashiCorp making this change. Some developers get mad. Some people are like, yeah, they need to make money. Where do you guys fall on this debate? What are what like? What's your thought process here? Kind of uh, share your viewpoints. So, um, open source is the most successful and so far the best means of production for building software uh, that the world has ever seen. The known and well understood restrictions have created and enabled an astounding amount of creativity and economic value. We are realists and we understand that um, you know, there, there can be a desire to um, pull the ladder up, to create a moat, um, and so on. I mean, you know, again, um, investors always want to know what your moat is, and perhaps the moat is, I'm going to, I'm just going to be polite. Yeah, so having, a, you know, perhaps a, a shared source or a non-open source license. Now, there are some issues with this. Um in that it, it moves us back into a world of having to ask for permission, hmm. having to ask explicit permission to very often extremely powerful companies who weirdly may not have your best interest at heart. So, I mean, look, I understand that Meta only cares about people, right? And all they want to do is connect everybody. I get it. It's great. Lovely. Um, but whether I should completely trust that the thing they called open, when I go and grow a business, remains open, and they're already writing it in. This idea that you can have a bit of success, but not too much, <laughs> is a bit weird. And, and I, I think that it does create jagged edges. It does create a lot of paper cuts. It will make um, it harder to write software now, but look, I'm a realist. And so we can advise our clients, you know, and companies have good businesses, good businesses. And I'm like, wait, what is it that you're, why are you, why do you need this other thing when actually you're being very successful? Well, the, the siren song, I, I get it. And we, 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 we're realists, right? We, we have a view um, we do think that um, uh, open source licensing is good and you can build great businesses with it. But, um, you know, I also understand why people are feeling they need to make even more money and stuff, because that's capitalism. 
So, um, you know, people make bad decisions and we have to live with that. And it does get all more complicated with AI. Right. You know, models are not open source. Some of the code and the libraries around them are. And, then, and then, the, you know, this is where I am. I think in building businesses, you want um, certainty and you can't be in a thing of like rug pulls. Mm -hmm. And when I see companies doing rug pulls because they used open source as a means to build a community, to get people excited, to maybe not write all the code because different software companies work in different ways. Sometimes it's, there are a lot of contributors from outside. Sometimes very often there are not. But the rug pull, the rug pull, I, I'm not fond of that because if people have been excited and you've been part of this open source thing and then one day they turn around and they're like, we're relicensing, I, I mean, it, it's not great. So um, I don't have any strong opinions about this. Um, <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> I believe that the market will decide. Capitalism is great and we can trust all corporations and especially the big ones because why would you not? I think uh, you know that 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 was a a great rant to uh, to to have and express uh, express our opinions. Um, uh, you know, just to just to wrap things up here um, uh, for for each of you, uh, you know, what, what's coming up uh, for for Red Monk uh, or uh, or a post that you're thinking about or whatever that um, that you know viewers should be excited about to uh, check out. So maybe Kate, if we start with you. Yeah, well, like I said, the front end uh, newest new Kingmakers um, is a series. So I'm going to uh, follow up with two more pieces for that. And then uh, I'd say, you know, I both James and I, all the, the analysts, we do a lot of um, our, our own sort of podcast work videos. Um, so if you follow us on the Monk cast, you'll get to hear us sort of pontificate on, on a number of these subjects. And we've always got really interesting uh, guests, usually developers who are talking to us about what they think is exciting. Uh, and then, of course, I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter, and you can uh, find me there. I'll pass to James. Okay. Well, I'm currently working on a conference. Like, I haven't run it in, like, four years because of lockdown and some family stuff and everything else, but it's, like, my labor of love. Um, the 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 one in that Steve runs in um, Portland, Maine, is in October. That's the Monktoberfest. Mm -hmm. So that's always worth checking out. It is the best conference apart from my conference, which is Monkey Gras, <laughs> which is in London, uh, coming up in March. And and the theme this year, my theme changes a bit every year, is going to be about prompt engineering. Mm. Because, you know, your questions are right on the money. AI is super exciting. Um, but, but also looking at the craft aspects of it, the craft of prompt engineering, the social aspects of it, some of the the fear issues of it, um, the the opportunity. So I'm 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 just very excited about um this 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 AI change in the industry because look, software development is a fascinating field. You know, it has been, it's now, I mean, it's my life's work understanding it. And it continues to be fascinating. Um, and there are all sorts of of you know interesting areas, whether I'm looking at like progressive delivery, which is all the blue greens and feature flags and everything else on top of the pipelines. You know, I, I, th I think that, 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 you know, getting better at writing software, that's so interesting to me. That's fascinating. But, but yeah, if we look at just that fundamental change, that disjunction, when the cards sort of, you know, uh, flutter around a bit and stuff is exciting and you have to re-understand, reimagine the world and dive in and help people understand it, which is what I like to do. AI is that. So yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm as excited about the opportunities at the moment as I've ever been. And that's a pretty good place to be. And, and, and yeah, so just continue as you work. So yeah, engage with us. If you're interested in the intersection of software delivery, AI, cloud, um, developer experience, that's what we're all about. And um, yeah, it's good times. Well, on that note, we will end things. I think we have the uh, the optimistic side coming out to to end the podcast here, which is which is great. Um, thank you both so much for the time, and we will link to all of the content that uh, your team puts out. Thank you for putting that out for the rest of us because we all enjoy it. Uh, it certainly captures the zeitgeist of all of us, uh, and you know, I think also as we have determined in this podcast, sometimes even sheds light on some of our biases that we bring to bear, even when you guys publish something simple. Uh, in terms of what you're just trying to call out, but then uh, pulls it forward. So really appreciate it and keep up the great work.